can feel it from here. <laughs> Greetings R18 fans, Andy Dukes here with some very special guests joining us from right across the world of BMW Motorrad. What are we doing today? We're going to take a much deeper dive into the design process and engineering excellence that has gone into this latest model, with those directly responsible for making it happen, before exploring a few of the many customization options for the R18, which, as you'll know by now, is due for imminent arrival in dealers. Can't wait for that one. Then, we're going to take a closer look at the R R18 Dragster project with the guy who designed and built it, the one and only Roland Sands. We're putting Roland on near the end, as it's super early in California right now, and I have it on good authority that he's not a morning person. And as an extra special treat, did you see the Bletchman R18 that broke cover last week? It's yet another seriously impressive custom using the R18 as a base, and we've managed to persuade its builder, Bernard Nauman, to come on the podcast and talk us through the process or at least what went on in his head while creating it. And last, but definitely not least, we're gonna make time for our special guests to answer your questions about whatever you wanna know about the RA team. So please get posting now in the comments section and we'll rattle through as many as we can. So, firstly, let's bring in three guys, all of them instrumental in very different ways for the look, the performance, and the endless customization possibilities offered by the RA team. Welcome Edgar, Christian, and Kurt, and give me a wave if you can hear me loud and clear in Munich. <laughs> <laughs> Always a good sign. All right. Well, let's start with you first, Christian. So, how are you doing today? You all right? Absolutely fine. Yes, Andy. Nice to see you again. Well, listen, yeah. after all the build-up, the early concepts, the Gorilla Bikes, and the Bavarian Soul Story episodes, the series up R18, it's finally here, and everyone's really excited. Everything's been leading up to this point, and now, of course, it all makes perfect sense. BMW just had to be in this segment, didn't they? Absolutely, Andy. Uh, it's a huge segment, and uh, we talk about 30% uh, of the 500cc plus market, and therefore, uh, it had to be our target to offer something really emotional and authentic BMW. And believe me, after five really, really long years of research, development, endless discussions, and uh, solutions back and forth, uh, the preparation is finished, and here we are today. Here we are today indeed, five years, well, wow, but that went quickly. So R18, it's just one letter and two numbers, but it's a whole new world in motorcycling terms, Christian. Now, to someone who doesn't live in this world, how would you explain the rules of the segment? And of course, how BMW Motorrad interpreted them with this new bike? Yes, Andy, the, actually the cruiser segment is a segment where you need a massive bike with a massive engine to have a relaxed and, and a cool ride. So definitely in that segment size matters and uh, that's uh, what we were aiming at. Uh, very important is the ride stance, the looks. The, the cruiser has to be long and low. It has to ride very, very relaxed and uh, pleasing everyone. So. Uh, very important for us was to have the boxer in the center of this uh, concept and uh, therefore we really worked uh, with all our engineering ideas for, uh, for yeah for quite a while to to decide which engine type to use but of course there was no other choice than using our uh, 1800 uh, boxer engine a boxer type engine because the boxer is the heart of bmw we as you might know we have started with this engine type a hundred years ago with our first bike in 1923 so it had to be in a boxer engine and also very typical is the shaft drive for bmw so we have a lot of shaft drives in our offer and this time uh, we even managed to uh, offer it without a uh, housing so you see a pure mechanical piece working underneath you while you're riding yeah, it looks absolutely fantastic and uh, great that we've got that mobile camera here today. I think uh, whoever's operating that is going to be really, really busy. Now, of course, BMW <laughs> Motrad, they've got a pioneering reputation for innovation and, and treading their own path right across all market segments. So I guess they were never going to be satisfied with just a great looking cruiser. It also has to offer market leading innovation, right? So can you tell us about some of the USPs of the R18, you know, within its class? 
Yes, uh, of course, uh, we were thinking about that as well, and uh, I wanted to point out, first of all, our um, LED headlights. So uh, the bike is uh, equipped with full LED headlight and LED indicators, so you have to be visible uh, when it comes to rider safety. That is, a, that is a standard in many bikes, but we also wanted to bring that into our cruiser. Also, of course, uh, we wanted to, to have a, a real good rideable bike and we offer a lot of torque with that engine, as you can imagine. And uh, therefore, we of offer, of course, a standard traction control system on our bike uh, as uh, standard, yeah. Yeah. Much. And that helps you with, especially with slippery roads, of course. Yeah, totally, yeah. I'm also interested, Christian, in, in the technology options that you have to increase your ride experience even further on the RA team. You know, like things like reverse assist, hill start control, headlight pro. Can you tell us a little bit more about these, please? Yes, uh, the reverse assist, you cannot see that. You can actuate it with a, with a nice little chrome lever on the left side of the bike. And of course, it helps you when you move the bike around and you, you need to uh, go in a narrow parking space or in your parking garage and you want to back a little bit. Uh, it's, a, it's a big bike and so a little help is always welcome. Then, of course, we have our uh, standard ABS system that is uh, definitely a need for every bike and uh, that, uh, that works well with the reverse uh, assist here. Uh, and that ABS system is used to uh, operate uh, the hill start control system. So when, you, when you're standing and stopping on the gradient, then of course uh, the hill start control prevents you from uh, rolling backwards. So you have a, an auto stop, so to speak. And uh, when you uh, accelerate the bike again, it easy maneuvers back uh, on, on little speed. So you have no problems there as well. Um, another option that you mentioned is the headlight, uh, the headlight pro and headlight pro here on the bike um, uh, can be equipped and uh, then you have the, uh, the advantage that, um, that you, when you go around corners that you have an adapter cornering light and you have a better vision, uh, especially when you're riding at night, of course. Wow, a lot of things in the segment, that's for sure, many firsts. Now, BMW Motrad is a brand that takes its heritage seriously, and, and this is a serious offering, of course. But what kind of riders do you think might want to see an R18 in their garage, Christian? Well, uh, that's, that's a good question, but uh, we think, of course, that, that riders that uh, ride a cruiser today would be interested to, to uh, take a test ride. But on the other hand, we have a lot, a lot of uh, other riders that are interested and showed interest already that, for example, are riding uh, totally different types of bikes today, sports bikes or enduro bikes. Uh, because everyone is, in, is really um, pleased when he sees the, the details that we, and, the, and the love and the work that we have put into this bike. And uh, so I wouldn't exclude anyone to, to take a test ride and to look at the bike live because uh, due to the corona situation we of course uh, cannot show the bikes uh, uh, a lot uh, live other than at the dealers very soon. So uh, then it's always digital so it never comes as close as if you're with the real bike and take a test ride and look what it is, does to you if it touches your heart or not. If it does we have yeah. done a good job. Yeah, yeah, you're right. Test rides are not far away and we're doing the best as we as we can until then. But yeah, loads of food for thought there. Thanks for that, Christian. You got, certainly got me thinking, you know, maybe if I cleared my wife's car out of the garage, I could definitely fit an R18 in there <laughs> next to my other I can bikes. imagine. But, yeah, I speak to anyway, your wife. <laughs> before I get myself in any more trouble, let's move on to BMW Motorrad's head of design and ask yes. you to come to the front, Edgar, because it's great to have you here on the live podcast. Thanks for coming on board. Thank you. Hi, welcome, Andy. Yeah, well, listen, Edgar, we know the R18's got some amazing modern technology wrapped and hidden also, of course, in a classic timeless look. But I, I want to ask you, what was the starting point for getting those proportions right? After all, it's not only about how the bike looks, but also how the riders themselves look on the bike, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely correct, uh, Andy. I mean, just Christian just pointed out about all the technology inside. There is, of course, all the technology inside, lots of uh, quality and uh, innovation stuff. But uh, a bike about this, this is about the looks, the feel and the sound, obviously. And, of course, how the rider looks on the bike. Uh, and that was most important for us from the very beginning of the project. So when we started the project, First of all, we did a deep dive into our history. And uh, we haven't exploited this too much, actually, to be honest. I mean, we did a bit on the, on the R90, you know this. 
we, we, that was very successful, and we learned a lot from this. And here, we did even more. I mean, and uh, of course, everybody knows who has a little bit idea about this. We have a very, very rich history, history, and and there is a big, a big vault of innovative and classy and beautiful solutions. So, what we at the end of the day we did, we kind of condensed some icons which we find on all the, the bikes from the 30s, 40s, 50s and so on. Uh, for example, if we point them out, we condensed to five what we call design icons, which first of all is the typical tank shape here. We know it from the R5 or some other bikes. Very typical BMW-ish. Then, of course, we have this very typical triangular frame layout, which uh, looks like a rigid frame here. Also, we know from the, for example, the R5. Uh, combined also with the shaft drive, with the encaged rear axle housing, very, very iconic also. Uh, then, of course, obviously, the black paint combined with a double pinstripe white lining. Uh, everybody knows this. And last not least, obviously, the boxer engine, the big flat twin engine. Uh, and of course, these were the basic, uh, basic proportions which were given. It uh, sums up to this long and low stance and proportion. Um, and of course, like you mentioned at the beginning, it's very important how the rider sits on the bike and it, looks, it makes him look cool, most important. Yeah. Totally agree with you. Yeah, it's 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 all about the stance, and uh, yeah, you've got a lot of history to draw upon. Then it looks to me like you've just taken the best bits, you know. But of course, when something just works design-wise, people actually don't often notice it. So, can you show us how the you know the paired back less is more purest design works on the R18? You know, in terms of how it feels, its weight, its balance, its ergonomics. I mean, these are things that are actually easy to get wrong in design, aren't they? It's, it's probably very, very easy. Uh, like my friend Ole used to say, you know, it's very easy to get things complicated nowadays, but it's definitely difficult to keep it simple. And that mm. was very, very important. That's probably one of the most difficult things in modern bike uh, development, to keep a naked bike, an unfair bike, keep it clean without any clutters uh, and a cool and nice, clean look. And that was most important. Uh, you can imagine this is a very modern bike. Christian just pointed out it has all the safety, the homologation, the, the, all this uh, sound emission stuff which needs, to be, uh, which needs to be fulfilled by homologation. But that requires lots of cables, black boxes, wires, sensors, and all this stuff. And of course, you've you got to have it. There's no, no way around it. But you have to, still, you have to get the bike clean. And that's probably what I think is the biggest achievement on the bike that really achieved this. The look, the feel, and the sound, and the quality look, and the, the material quality of the bike. That's, I think that's a real big achievement. Yeah, absolutely. It is certainly very, very clean. And there's a lot hidden, and it's not easy to do for sure. So, and that's why I'm interested in things that you don't see immediately, you know, like how the swing arm appears to connect seamlessly to the main frame, thanks to that clever hidden rear strut. I mean, how did you transport that rigid frame concept of the R5 to the present day and somehow work in that cantilevered soft tail rear end that looks to me at least like it has no suspension, but I think it actually rewards a rider with about 90 mil of travel, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, the, the, the team, the designers and the engineers, I think they did a very marvelous job because we could achieve to keep this triangular frame, this very classic look uh, driven from the, from the old BMWs, but still you have all the technology and the comfort what you need to have. Of course, there is a swing arm, the swing arm, uh, sorry, the, the, the suspension, the shock absorber. It's, it's located in, a, in an area you don't really see. And all, or most of the technology which you don't want to see is hidden inside the bike. It's, of course, there. And that's what I meant. This is really real big achievement here. Yeah, probably going to get the mobile camera guy to go to work again a little bit here, Edgar, because there's, there's also the <laughs> technology as well as the design that you might not have noticed straight away. You know, like the state-of-the-art LED light housings. That I think they've been designed for implement, 
implementation in the classic headlight shape. I mean, it's more than just function here, isn't it? Everything actually has to look right too. Uh, of course, I mean, just as I pointed out, it, it's, it's, the achievement is that all the technology is in there, but it looks very clean, very nice. And what I like probably also very much on the bike is uh, the looks of the engine, because the, what I like so much on an on a engine like the Boxer is, I like to talk about the semantics of the Boxer. I mean, you see the air box here, you see something is going inside the cylinder head, something is happening there, there is the power in, and then here the exhaust fumes, they go out here, and you almost can, can, you can almost see how a boxer engine works. This is what I mean about semantics. You can feel with your guts, you can see what the engine is doing inside, and this is something marvelous, I really love this. And moreover, with the shaft drive, with the open shaft drive, which is turning while the bike is moving, you already see the momentum going from the engine to the rear axle and to the rear tire. Uh, this, is, this is very beautiful. I personally like to talk about this engine as a, a piece of art, a sculpture in metal, a sculpture cast in metal, if you want so. I mean, I, I'm really super excited by this engine. If you sit on the bike, uh, I mean, you feel the power of the bike. Yeah, I mean, I think everybody, everybody, all the fans were really delighted to see that visible open drive shaft because, of course, it masterfully transposes that iconic style of past times right up to the present day. It's just my opinion. It's certainly one of my favorite design components of the R18, but I'm interested to know what are yours, Edgar? I mean, first of all, it's the engine, like I mentioned already. It's, uh, I like, just like to see this analog style of the engine. It's, it's, it feels very analog, the bike. Uh, there's, all, of course, as mentioned, lots of electronics in there. You need to have it, you gotta have it. But the materials, the, sh the, the sheet metal, uh, the, the cast, the polished things, and at the end of the day, it's about, again, I have to say it, it's about the looks, the feel, and the sound. And this is kind of the essence of the bike. Everything is perfect uh, from, the, from the overall proportion down to the last detail. I mean, there's lots of details on there, beautifully made, like the, 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 the calipers here, the, the levers here, the, the graphic of the Speedo, uh, the tank cap, really nicely done, like a little jewel here. Uh, the seating, the fixing of the seat, I mean, you name it. You, you, I, I can't point out everything. There's like so many nice little details and jewels on the bike. You have to look at it uh, by yourself. Yeah, I think everyone just needs to go into their dealers and spend at least a couple of hours looking at the details because, you know, indeed it is the sum of its parts. And we're going to talk about parts in a little bit, but thanks for now, Edgar, because there are some really great design insights there. And we'll come back to you and Christian shortly to talk about customization. But I want to bring in Kurt at this point, hanging around at the back there. Cause, <laughs> well, as, he, as he moves himself forward, the viewers may recognize him from, I think it was an earlier Boxer episode of the Bavarian Soul Story, because he's the guy responsible for the 1800cc motor, and he's the best person to reveal some of the technical marvels hidden yeah. inside that huge engine block. So, hi there, Kurt. It's great to see you again, mate. Uh, hello, uh, Andy. It's great to see you again, uh, or hear you, basically. <laughs> Uh, I can see you, you probably can't see me, but yeah. you don't want to see me, don't worry. But <laughs> listen, just going back to the early days of this project, Kurt, how exciting was it to go where no BMW engineer had gone before? Uh, it was very exciting, but first of all I have to say it was a, a kind of a big surprise that I've been asked to uh, step into this project and yeah, be part of this uh, yeah, a great honor to be part of this uh, special uh, development project. And uh, yeah, it's, a, it's the biggest boxer engine uh, in BMW history. And uh, it's a petrol monster uh, in times of uh, zero emissions and uh, um, electric cars and so on. Um, but uh, I have to say it's, uh, uh, it fulfills, it's a, it's a high-tech monster. In a, in a beautiful dress and uh, it fulfills all uh, um, actual and the hardest uh, requirements in uh, pollution and emission and uh, so I would say it's a clean monster. Yeah. 
<laughs> I've heard it call a, called a lot of things, but never a clean monster. I like that. <laughs> For sure, it's a, it's a bit of a beast, Kurt, and, and a real sculpture and metal, to paraphrase, paraphrase what Edgar was saying earlier. So just how much does that huge engine and gearbox weigh then, Kurt? And give some of the other specs while you're at it as well. Uh, yeah, uh, maybe as you, as you know, uh, in my former life, I've been part of motorsport. So lightweight was uh, one of the main targets for me. Always so, uh, here it's a really lightweight construction. So uh, the, the engine, uh, uh, the gearbox, and for sure the air intake system weighs only 110 kilograms. So it's uh, lightweight. <laughs> no, <laughs> fun. It's, it's, uh, so you, you get, you get a, a, a lot for your money. And, uh, but also is every part uh, is uh, you, 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 know, you get what you see basically. Uh, there you have got the uh, front engine cover, as well, uh, uh, for example, which is made out of aluminium. Then we've got the star nut, which is casted. Then we've got the cylinder head covers, which is aluminium. Then we've got the air intake covers, which is aluminium. So it's really, you, uh, you get what you see. There's only one thing, maybe the reasons I should not mention at the moment, uh, but uh, some things have driven us to let this cover here, the airbox cover, at the end is finally made out of plastic so but that's the only piece uh, what i would know at the moment which is uh, uh yeah it looks like a metal but it's made out of plastic chrome there's, there's enough other parts in metal on this bike <laughs> I mean, you know yeah. especially that especially that open drive shaft eh, Kurt? <laughs> yeah, yeah 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 that's a fantastic part <laughs> i really enjoy it i really like it it was a hard hard bunch of work but uh finally Finally, I'm, yeah, I'm proud. I'm proud of it and I'm really happy to, to see it. And yes. yeah, at the, at the end, I also have to say it's a 1,802 8, 8, uh, cubic inches, uh, cubic centimeters uh, 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 capacity. Then we've got a 107.1 uh, uh, bore. We've got a 100 millimeter stroke. The engine uh, uh, pulls 91 horses and uh, we've got uh, 158 newton meters of torque yeah well more on that uh, talk later but we'll come back to that but on the road i can imagine you know that the new r18 is going to certainly be an imposing silhouette when you see one fast approaching in your mirrors filling up your mirrors indeed so do you think riders who are fans of the iconic bmw bikes from the past can truly appreciate the engineering the thought and the dedication that's gone into into this latest big boxer kurt Yes, uh, uh, yes, I think so. Um, yeah, it's a it's a big cruiser. Uh, it's a very big cruiser, but it's uh, it, it's still it, it's still a, a real BMW bike. So it's um, great fun to ride. Um, I personally uh, really, for my opinion, I would say it's a good looking bike. But maybe they are not that really objective. Uh, <laughs> um, uh, but. For me, it's the fantastic thing when you look on the when you sit on the bike and uh, you look down on these two little cylinders, and uh, that's that's an amazing amazing view. And still, still for me, it's a it's a moment of uh, goosebumps when I start the engine, uh, even if I did it many times now. But uh, when it uh, comes to life and it shakes and it rattles and uh, the torque turns the the bike from one side to the other, uh, yeah, it's it's for me amazing, and I really think that's what uh, uh, what the people uh, or the the customers uh, will appreciate and uh, will have some fun with the bike. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, goosebumps. I can see what it means to you, Kurt, <laughs> absolutely, 100%. Because, well, yeah, as we know, it's the biggest boxing, boxer engine ever and, and the most torque. You mentioned that earlier. I believe there's over 150 newton meters available at all times. So put that in perspective for us, Kurt. Can you explain what that feels like to ride that fat curve? That, tell us about the torque, you know, what's important, <laughs> where you need it. Because obviously you said you came from a motorsport background, but this is different. This is definitely not about horsepower and high revs for a relaxed ride, is it? Yeah, no, no. For, for me, it's, uh, for me it's, uh, as, you, as you mentioned, it, it's uh, uh, the, the wide and the flat uh, torque curve. So we've got uh, more than uh, 150 Newton meters uh, from 2000 till 4000 RPMs. And uh, 
uh, that that uh, talk uh, makes uh, for me relaxed riding possible. Uh, and we've got a very long gearbox as well uh, to calm down uh, the bike a little bit. Still doesn't make it boring, but uh, uh, just to uh, just to calm it down. And uh, so you can use. When you ride it, you can use most of the time the highest gear, so fourth, fifth, sixth gear, and uh, just enjoy uh, the torque when you when you uh, pull the throttle. And so when I ride normally through the countryside, I use uh, fifth gear because with fifth gear you can go down to uh, let's say 1,200 RPMs, which is around about 45, 50 k's. So for the for the villages, and then when you exit the, the villages, you just uh, pull the throttle and uh, enjoy and it still accelerates uh, nicely to 100 sometimes 120 and uh, yeah uh, it's it, it's great fun but uh, on the other hand side we've got the the modes uh, um, the different riding modes so if you want to have a more lively engine character uh, you can uh, choose the rock mode uh, or when you just want to roll you use the roll mode yeah, for the for the normal funny cruising and um, for me, sometimes, as I said, yes, uh, mainly I use fifth gear, but sometimes I also want to feel uh, uh, our engine and want to feel the, as Edgar said, the, the performance and to, to really uh, 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 feel what's going on. And then you can easily make an, uh, a nice acceleration from first to third, fourth, fifth gear or you shift down in the villages when the sign when the village ends in third gear you pull the throttle you go through the gears enjoy the torque enjoy the the pulling of the of the bike and for me it's i would say most of the people will just put a smile on your face yeah it's a i i i only can say i i really enjoy riding the bike you've put a smile on my face just listening to you describe <laughs> it yeah absolutely brilliant and yeah like you say you know it pulls like a train it looks great but it's also how it sounds isn't it Kurt you know I, I want to know what the engineers did to get that engine to sound so good as well yeah uh, uh, sound sound is uh, yeah it's always a kind of feeling uh, for sure sound is also a sub subjective uh, uh, thing and it's uh, very hard to really put it into uh, just technical parameters but uh, for sure, we worked a lot on uh, on the sound and to to get a typical boxer sound that when you open the throttle, you you hear the air intake system. Uh, when you uh, 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 then also you, you have got the exhaust uh, 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 that you hear, but also some typical uh, uh, boxer uh, engine, typically uh, technical noises like uh, here the. Uh, uh, um, uh, push rods with the fork rocker arms without hydraulic elements. So uh, there's no hydraulic element to make the valve clearance adjustment. So what I really think personally, I think that some old mechanics uh, will come back, uh, uh, will be reactivated from retirement to uh, show the young guys, uh, which are not used anymore, to make the adjustment of, uh, of the valve clearance. Yeah. Fantastic. That's brilliant. Listen, finally, Kurt, I just want to ask you to say a few words about the workmanship, you know, the attention to detail and the materials used in the heart of the new R18, because from what I can tell, there's been no expense spared in choosing the, you know, the best quality materials to offer the strength, the reliability, the longevity that the owners ultimately will expect from such a premium product, won't they? Yes. Uh, there, I really have to say, first of all, thanks to the uh, to the designers and the whole design team uh, that they were pushing us so hard uh, to keep the design and don't allow us uh, too many technical changes uh, for sure would have made our life much much more easier uh, but at the end when you look at the bike and okay for me especially the drivetrain engine and drivetrain uh, uh, it was, was really worse to go the hard way. Uh, so for me, the result, uh, yeah, it's just a, just a beautiful bike, uh, what uh, finally came out there. And uh, materials, what we used, uh, yeah, uh, as I mentioned before, the covers and everything. Then we've got uh, um, our uh, uh, crankcase, the oil pan, uh, the um, bell housing, 
the uh, gearbox housing, then for sure uh, for the rear axle, the housing is uh, all aluminium cast, uh, as well as the uh, uh, crankcase covers, which are also made out of uh, aluminium cast. And for me, they are a very, very important part uh, to make this view, this look, uh, this bullet look of the, of the whole engine. And uh, um, as uh, Edgar also mentioned before, uh, what for me a big surprise now when you, when you look at it is how green it is. Um, that you really, you don't see bolts, you don't see uh, uh, really the, the mechanical parts, but I know that everything is there. So, <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, but I, I think, yeah, I, then we've got the, the, the cylinders, uh, the cylinders are, are nickel seal coated, so that means a very hard coating uh, to make it very uh, uh, long life. Uh, then uh, something special for sure, what we've got here is due to the big uh, uh, bore, uh, we've got a, a big distance of the cylinders. So what we had to bring in was a third uh, crankshaft bearing. Uh, but at the end, I would say that's one of the reasons why we made this ground engine uh, almost kind of bulletproof. And uh, one single spec, what I also want to mention is, uh, uh, was hard work, but also for me something what I'm really proud of it is, uh, is the clutch. So we've got the first time is a, is a single, uh, a self-reinforcing uh, single plate tri-clutch uh, with a back torque limiting function. So that means with a slipper uh, uh, clutch function, uh, which is uh, for such a big engine, uh, uh, very positive when you shift down the gears and everything, this uh, slipper clutch function uh, makes it much, much more easier to, to handle the bike and ride the bike. Yeah. And, but yeah, finally, I, I could keep on going uh, all the time for all these uh, bits and pieces and materials, uh, but I think uh, uh, people fall asleep or get bored of it. So, <laughs> finally. Not at all, not at all, not at all. <laughs> I, I could listen to you all day, Kirk, uh, honestly. I just want to ask the camera guy to just zoom up closely on, on one thing that I want to see, and it's the uh, star nut of the header pipes, you know. Can you just, <laughs> can you just point, point him in the right direction, yeah. please, and just tell us about that, because they're, they're pretty special, aren't they? Here we are. So, the, the, the star nut is, uh, first of all, it's an, uh, uh, a very beautiful part. But the uh, uh, most important thing is that it's really a functional part. So that means uh, it, uh, it's, it's, it is the nut that uh, fixes the headers to the cylinder head. And uh, so that was also one of the important things what uh, uh, people mentioned before, and I think everybody now in the community knows, that we really try to um, uh, uh, really make uh, technical solutions, good looking technical solutions and uh, uh, the star nut is also one of the pieces when you look, when you sit on the bike, and I hope the people in the uh, community outside there have got the chance uh, very soon uh, at the dealers to, to sit on the bike and get the impression like I've got it, uh, that when you look down on the cylinders, when you look down on the, on the push rods, on the star nut and everything, it's, it's, it's nice. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely brilliant. Listen, cheers, Kurt. It is clear to see your passion, mate. And thanks for sharing it with us. Just just to the viewers, if there's anything specific you want to ask Kurt or the other guys, then post us a question if you're watching live. But for now, actually, before we go back to Christian and Edgar to tell us more about the wonderful world of customization R18 style, let's have a look at a short clip before we have a chat about what the many possibilities are with various parts and accessories. Welcome back, Christian. Welcome back, Edgar. Kurt was brilliant, wasn't he? I'd love to see that passion. <laughs> and I think I, I see that among so many people that I talk to when I, when I travel over to Munich. Now, Christian, as we've, as we've heard from Kurt, the bike itself is a technical marvel. We can see that. But I want to touch on the fact that it's been designed from the ground up for easy customization. 
Also, the fact that BMW Motorrad's teamed up with some renowned and respected partners in the scene to offer a big range of parts and accessories to make an R18 your R18. More on that shortly, but customization, why is it massively important in this sector? Well, customization is, uh, I guess, something that drives us all. Uh, no one wants to have the same bike like your neighbor, like your buddy. So everyone is an individual. And uh, of course, you want to have reflect your personality in your motorcycle. And uh, cruisers are the prototype of uh, uh, expressing your personality, make it your own. And of course, uh, we did a lot of work and uh, that's why Kurt deserved the smiles and uh, the proudness because he did all the hard job when, uh, when we had uh, the requests for easy customization, exchangeable parts. And uh, with our help from, from the design team, of course, we wanted that to be as flexible as possible. And that's easy to say and very hard to do. So uh, we really uh, had that as one of the key project um, targets and uh, we learned from the R90 which was already very very easy to customize and we put all that engineering thought into the R18 as well so we can promise that it's not only mechanically but also electrically easy to make it your own style. Fantastic yeah and you've got some seriously cool accessories partners on board with this project haven't you Christian? Absolutely so yes. Can you tell us a little bit more about what's happening with Roland Sands Design, v &H, and and Mustang Seats also? Yes, uh, we have worked very successfully with Roland and uh, he's not only a very fast rider but also a genius when it comes to design and to technology so we like his parts, his, his style and we asked him to cooperate with us uh, with some really nice design parts so we'll offer uh, uh, quite some range of uh, Ronzan's design parts uh, to individualize your bike. We asked uh, the team from uh, Vance and Heinz for some special mufflers and we know that mufflers are something that uh, everyone has his personal taste. Some like this style, some like the other style and uh, we have to fulfill a lot of homologation uh, requirements from uh, various markets so definitely we needed a good partner to offer uh, the different styles and types of exhausts. And uh, last but not least, seats are something very special. You need uh, different colors, you need different heights, you need uh, a one seat uh, and sometimes you take a pillion so you want a two seater as well or exchange the seat according to the needs. So definitely seats uh, to work with Mustang was uh, an easy one and uh, the guys were happy to work with us and we found some really nice solutions, we promise. Yeah. It's definitely a smart move there for sure. Over to you, Edgar. Um, for me, the, the R18, it's all about ease of customization and expressing yourself. So was the conversion-friendly design a prerequisite right from the beginning of this project? Uh, <clears throat> yes, Andy. Uh, that was definitely from the very beginning. Uh, as, as Christian already mentioned, we learned a lot from the, from the R90. Uh, I always like to say, uh, basically, a bike, a bike is about emotion. It's not so much about purpose. It's about emotion, and a bike is actually the biggest accessory you can wear. And you want to express your your style, your lifestyle, and your, your feelings somehow with your emotions with this bike. So this is why it's so important to get the customization, to give a big variety, give big options for the customer to do whatever he wants to he wants to express. Yeah, and like you said, from the beginning, it was very, very important. Uh, we already did, uh, in, in a modern bike, I have to say, on a modern bike, it's, customization is not so easy anymore. Because whenever you put some electric component, uh, you have a big problem with your computers, with your CAN bus system. So it's not so easy like it used to be from the bikes from the 70s or 80s. So this is a big issue. The bike here is designed that you can do this. <clears throat> Not talking about the hardware itself. The hardware, of course, is easy. You can interchange handlebars or lamps. Oh, lamp is electric again. But you can change handlebars, you can change seats, uh, exhaust pipe, wheels, little bits and pieces, whatever. Uh, there is so much variety. And to us, it's very important to offer this big variety. And even if there is uh, parts from outside, from the aftermarket, for example, like Roland Sands or other guys, this is very good for us because uh, it, uh, it raises the, how do you say, the, the, the I miss the German, the English word, sorry, the Begehrlichkeit. Uh, uh, we miss the word, Andy. 
Sorry. Don't worry. It, raises the bar, raises the level, raises the amount of choice. Um, the more parts bring, are it there, it, yeah. it's more important, it's more interesting getting for the, for the customers. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah, and, and as you said, there, there's loads of options with various partners with BMW Motorrad for customizing these R18s. And of course, they're, they're even more on the way. And I can see two very different looking models there. And I guess, you know, that shows how easy it is to create quite look quite different looking bikes from from a base so Edgar can you just talk us through what some of those options on those two bikes might be then yeah definitely you're right uh, we didn't mention it but this is the first edition bike that's basically the stock bike what you can buy now uh, and it comes like this with all these very beautiful chrome covers uh, and, and, and lots of chrome and lots of nice nice details but what we see here uh, that's, uh, f let's say, a, one possible opt uh, customized version. There is, like I mentioned, there is different options. What you see here is, for example, very obviously, an ape hanger here, uh, equipped also with, uh, with caps here for the clutch and for the brake uh, uh, housings, uh, also with the cast mirrors here, the milled mirrors. Then what we have here is uh, the the headlight mask, blacked out cast part, also the speedo uh, cast part, and also four covers here. Uh, we, again, also we have the valve covers here in a blacked out milled version, uh, also the chest plate, they come together basically. Then what we have here is also a, a very different Vance and Heinz exhaust pipes, also different options. We have a Mustang seat here, we have a, a tank cap, which is probably not to be seen here so much. Uh, and very important also is different wheel sizes, because different wheel sizes really change the, the proportion of the bike. So either you have a bobber or you have a cruiser or you have a whatever, a sporty bike. So here we see a 21 inch cast wheel, milled cast and milled wheel with a 16 inch counterpart at the back, just as one option. But, uh, and there is many, many more little bits and pieces on this bike here. Uh, and again, like mentioned, there, there will be other options as well. Yeah, thanks, Edgar. It seems like the choice is endless. So while I'm pondering on that, I'm going to go back to Christian again, because with so many parts already available and, and so many of these choices to make, it's going to be fun to configure what your own R18 might be like, Christian. Now, I've heard there's an online tool that will enable you to do that from the comfort of your own home. So can you tell us a little bit more about this, please? Absolutely, Andy. Uh, yes, our conf configurator is, of course, not completely new. Uh, we, have, uh, we have offered that for our bikes up till today. So you could configure your bike with different color options and X factory options to see what it looks like uh, and also to see the price going up or down. Uh, but now we have also integrated our accessory line to those uh, to this configurator, so you can imagine what the bike looks like with the accessories that Edgar uh, has just mentioned with the Apinger version of the R18, uh, for example. So you could you could really configure your bike to make it your own, and uh, of course then uh, go to your dealer and ask uh, um, the, the bike to be in that version or this version printed out and say uh, I want this or that and get the dealer to order the bike X-Factory with the stuff that we offer and also the accessory line uh, where the dealer of course has to mount some of the components. Sounds fantastic. Listen guys, before I let you go, I've got to ask you how you both spec out your own R18s because I'm sure people watching are, are wanting to know which direction you both go in. So why don't you go first, Christian? Well, um, I was in love with the R18 concept, like, like many, many of our customers. Uh, uh, and uh, we have received a lot of questions. Uh, when I can I buy this bike? I want it exactly like this. So the, uh, to start with the bad news, you cannot buy it like this because it's not street legal. There are a lot of things or quite some things on there uh, where in most of the countries you get uh, absolutely no homolog homologation. But the good news is you can get very close. And so my target would be to build an R18 that looks uh, very much alike, like the concept. But to be very honest, uh, the more I look at the ape, ape hanger, uh, the more I, f I fall in love with a blacked out version with an ape hanger. So I'm not 100% decided. My, my mind is still full of ideas. Yes, I am. Oh. <laughs> you know that. Yeah. What about you, Edgar? 
uh, okay, uh, I just thinking about. It. Actually, you know, I like everything which has knobby tires, but still, uh, there is no 16-inch knobby tire as of now. I probably have to wait for this one. And as long as there is nothing like that, I would go for something a little bit uh, performing. Uh, I mean, I'm a big fan of the R18-2 concept, which we showed uh, on uh, ICMA last time. That's actually right now my favorite R18. I really love it. It's really nice. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it's a real tough choice, isn't it? I think whatever choice people make, they're always going to kind of go back and say, ah, maybe I should have done it another way. Maybe I've got to own two R18s. So I, I guess that configurator tool is really going to help people make that R18, their 18. So, and of course, you know, they should talk to their local dealers as well for additional inspiration. So before I let you go, I, can we see if there are any questions that have come in from our community? And if there are, let's bring them up on screen and uh, see what's going on there. Okay, I don't know if you can see this, guys. I'm going to read it out anyway, because you're probably a long way from any monitors. So question for Edgar. How would you say the how would you say does the analog R18 fit to the trend of more and more e-motorbikes coming to the market? Interesting question. Uh, definitely a good question also. Uh, I think there is definitely space for both worlds. But uh, right now, these worlds don't mingle, to be honest. This is something where we talk really about analog, about soul, about emotion bike. Uh, I don't say... Uh, e electric mobility is not uh, emotionally, not at all. Electric mobility is quite emotionally once you've ridden one of these things. But uh, and, I mean, we, we are really working on that uh, field, electric mobility. But uh, in, in our perception, uh, electric mobility is first of all very, very useful in urban areas, like, uh, like scooters, for example, like short short distance uh, transporting because urban areas is lots to do with acceleration, deceleration, recuperation, short, uh, short distances. So we believe very much that this is a, a very valid concept, but as of now in, uh, in uh, urban areas, this, once this thing develops, I see very much potential also in different fields of electromobility. Uh, maybe so, does, uh, check out the Concept DC Roadster, what we did like, I think, two years ago. Um, this is also a very, very valid concept, how this electromobility could turn into performance. Very interesting, uh, but this concept, I think, or this kind of uh, market segment, I do not see electromobility right now. Maybe you have a different uh, no, point of view. I, I fully agree, Edgar, and uh, just wanted to add that uh, our DC roads is definitely emotional, so that's yeah. what tells us that electromobility can be emotional. I, actually, yeah, I, I really want to point out this, uh, because uh, many people say, oh, elect uh, many, many riders, now they riders, they say, oh, electric bike, that's boring, I don't want it. Uh, I, I only can, uh, can uh, encourage you Take a test ride. Right? These things are really interesting. I mean, electromobility is definitely emotional. 100%. Yeah, agree with you. Thanks, Edgar. Thanks, Christian, as well. So let's bring another question up on screen then. <laughs> okay, Frank, uh, I'm not sure who's going to answer this. Maybe Edgar. Uh, why exactly 1800 cc? Why not 1700 or 1900? I'm sure there's a technical reason for that. Well, uh, I think <laughs> uh, I think that's uh, that's uh, hard to to answer. But uh, in the end, we wanted to be competitive. Uh, we needed a, definitely a three-digit uh, cubic inch uh, number. We wanted to have enough torque. Uh, Kurt pointed out all the details, and uh, we have tried out certain layouts, and we were convinced that with 110. We were competitive, we could offer an engine concept that brings this thing up to speed, is emotional and offers enough torque. And that's when, why we went for, for exactly 1802 cc or 110 cubic inches. Yeah, I mean, R R17 sounds a little bit strange and R19 would be confused with the R9 T, wouldn't it? So I think you're right, right on the money there. So can we have another question, that's please? That's a good idea, R19. R19. <laughs> Any other questions coming up on screen? 
Okay, that's fine. We're we'll done. leave it. We'll, We're done. we'll leave it. We'll leave it there for now because um, you know it's it's been brilliant so far. And thanks for all of your input today so far, guys. It's been a fun, fascinating behind the scenes insight into the thought process and and of course the long development of this bike. So huge thanks for all of us in the BMW Motorrad community. Bye for now. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. Thank you, Andy. Okay, I've kept them talking for long enough, but I think it's. Uh, early enough in California or late enough uh, and a good time in the podcast to bring in Roland Sands to tell us more about the story behind his latest R18 Dragster project. Now, before we do, if there's anything you want to ask Roland, now's your chance. So get posting and get your questions answered. And, and before we introduce the main man, let's stir the emotions with a clip, quick clip that features this stunning one-off build. a lot of things it's uh, over far too soon that's brilliant good morning roland thanks for joining us so early from the west coast yeah no problem happy to be on great work on the build by the way i loved watching uh, tommy's reaction when he wrote it in that latest episode of the varian soul story i think i think he was literally blown away by it wasn't he yeah you know the bike itself is pretty um it's shattering when you fire it up it uh it really wakes people up so i mean the fact that it's such a big motor and it has such a rumble to it it has such a unique sound too which i which i really like it doesn't sound anything like a v-twin so i think that you know the r18 you're going to definitely hear that bike come and it's going to have its own uh, its own song for sure yeah absolutely and if anyone's not seen it yet i highly recommend searching that one up and watching the full episode bavarian soul story i think it's episode 10 but don't quote me on that anyway tell us about this build roland it seems as if you went way back into your own childhood and racing past for inspiration for your r18 dragster which looks great next to you there oh thanks um yeah for me i, I mean racing's been just a part of who I, who I am and my family for a very long time. So my dad was a drag racer when he was younger. And it's one of my first memories was going to the drag strip and just being around like really heavy bikes, um, top fuel Harleys and all kinds of really crazy stuff, you know, pro stock, pro stock racing, top fuel racing and all just everything I can remember was, uh, just being in the pits and being around all this stuff. So, um, I just brought this, kind of heritage that wanted to bring the BMW heritage together with my history and past to build something that I think was authentic for me and like personally attached to what I really enjoy. And to me, this bike, when I first saw it, it just spoke hot rod. You know, the, the engine is um, so dramatic, the way it sits within the bike and it, it really pops. Like when you're sitting on top of the bike, you just look down and it's, it, rem it kind of reminded me when you looking at a hot rod you know and the pipes are sticking out from the side and it's just all m muscle and madness and, and this bike I think is a a good example of that for me I mean it's it's all motor it's more motor than any other bike I think we've worked on the motor such a big focus so um, yeah yeah, I mean, it, it's it's certainly got a lot of attitude and, and what a great way to grow up as well in that environment and those smells and those sounds. Because from what I heard from the Bavarian Soul Story episode, the, the bike sounds great too in its dragster form. So what tweaks have you done to the engine and, and tell us what a difference the nitrous has made? The motor itself is fairly stock. Um, we didn't touch the internals at all because I think um, we're still trying to figure out exactly what we can do with it performance wise. The basics were really 
the performance modifications were reducing the weight dramatically. Um, I think we took almost 150 pounds off the bike and um, we simplified as much as we could. You can see the, the rear of the bike is a rigid and that is driven from drag racing. Um, because we wanted to simplify the whole back of the bike, we changed the geometry a little bit too. We wanted to drop the thing down and lower it quite a bit. And that's why we use the uh, R9T forks to drop the bike down and it just sets the whole bike down low, gets it in a nice drag racing stance. Um, but the, the engine itself is predominantly intake and exhaust and tuning, so ECU tuning. Um, we kind of unplugged it as it may be. There's a little bit of controls on the motor that make it maybe a little bit more user friendly. So we're basically opening up the entire 1800 cc's to the world with this thing. So um, it's at first and I'm not I'm not normally like too affected by motorcycles. I've been around some loud stuff and some radical stuff. But the first time I fired this bike up, it was a little intimidating. The 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 shake and the rumble and the, the attitude of the bike and you revved it and it, you know, with all the with all the electronics um, just open up, the thing has quite a bit of torque and moves quite a bit. Um, but the cool thing is once you get going, I mean, it's just straight up like, you can feel that 150 foot pounds of torque. And I don't know, this thing probably has quite a bit more horsepower than the stock bike. I think it was, I think we, it's, it's making 20 more horsepower without nitrous. Um, and I'm sure the torque numbers are up a little bit, um, but it's, uh, it's, it has quite an effect on, on you when you ride it. Yeah, for sure. What's going to happen then, in your opinion, when you hook the nitrous up to it? The nitrous is hooked up. Um, and unfortunately, we didn't get to run it on nitrous because we literally finished the bike the night before we did the shoot. Um, the nitrous was all there, but we didn't have it dialed and tuned, and we didn't want to destroy the motor, which can happen with nitrous. So. It's all plumbed and everything is hooked up. So then the next time we run it will be on nitrous. And I think we're going to get another 50 horsepower out of it, um, you know, at full throttle. So it's tuned so that when you're running the bike at full throttle, that's when the nitrous opens up. And it also shoots an extra, um, an extra amount of fuel into the bike. So it richens the bike up and, and shoots the nitrous in. So I don't know, an extra 50 horsepower. It's going to be really fun. I think you're going to have to make another film about that because there'll be a lot of people wanting to watch that for sure. But of course, you know, the RA team is going to bring a lot of new riders to the brand and there are going to be a lot of them who are going to be thinking about taking their first steps in customization with this RA team. So how good a starting point would you say the base model is for this, Roland? Yeah, I think the RA team is a real nice platform to customize. Um, you know, Eddie and the guys, have done, I think, an excellent job of taking into account what makes customizing a bike easier. Um, there's a lot of bikes that are, I, in my opinion, very over-designed. So if you change one thing, you have to change all these other things where the R18, I think, is designed very, um, and segment is not the right word, but is it's, it's designed with customization in mind, meaning you can change out the headlight you know, and you can change out the headlight bezel, you can change out the instrument cluster, the valve covers, the breastplate, uh, the wheels, um, you know, and you can do all these things without really modifying the other things. Um, obviously, you want to customize your bike and make it cohesive, but um, you're, able to, you're able to pick and choose the parts that you want to do, and it's not like you have to change the whole back end of the bike. You know, you can, you can unbolt the subframe, which is on, I think a cruiser is uh, is really cool. It's not something that you usually see on more of a standard cruiser. So you, the back of the bike, like for, from a customizer's perspective, is wide open. You can do whatever you want. You know, you basically got a tire and a wheel back there, and then you can build whatever you want around it. So um, I think that th this version, we really work to retain the stock sheet metal. So you can see it's got stock gas tank, stock fender, stock headlight. <laughs> stock rear fender um but but a modified one um but if you wanted to go really crazy and and you know design completely new sheet metal like bernhard did um which i which i really like uh the the fairing that he did on his bike um i uh i, I think it's a great it's a great base model for customization 
Yeah, well, it's great to hear a customizer say that with, you know, over 200 builds under his belt. So it's going to be landing in showrooms soon. So do you feel like it's going to bring many new riders into BMW Motorrad dealers for the first time? You know, I think that BMW has a product that they've never had in the past. And so certainly they're going to get some new customers. You know, the V-Twin industry here in the in the States is a difficult one to break into. And, and you can see the the uh, Japanese um, manufacturers have tried to get into it in authentic ways. And I think it's really tough. Um, and what is unique about BMW is the history and heritage that they have building bikes in this genre in the past. So. To me, that, that makes it an authentic play for them. It's not some like Hail Mary, although a lot of people may view it that way initially when they think BMW, they don't think Cruiser, they think GS, they think S1000R. Um, but of course, they didn't think 9T either. They didn't think that the 9T was gonna be what it was. And, and I think the 9T really, really kicked off the, the heritage style motorcycle concept, um, not just for BMW, for, but for kind of the industry. So. It, it's going to be really interesting to see how the R18 plays in the large CC cruiser segment. I think it's, um, yeah, I think, I think, I think it's going, they're going to slide this one in. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. We're all, we're all watching closely for sure. Um, let's yeah. see if we've got any questions from the community that have come through for you, Roland, before we introduce our next guest and that bike that you mentioned earlier. So, Let's bring one of them up on the screen. Okay, I don't know if you can see that, but I'm gonna read it out anyway, Roland. It says, big respect for the R18 Dragster. This is from Sam Pack. Are you thinking of building another R18? If so, what might it look like, Roland? I think we might've lost you there, Roland. Hey Sam, thanks for the question. Um... You know, I have a few other sketches for bikes that we didn't end up. Can you hear me now? <laughs> I'm giving you the thumbs up. Um, I've got a few other options for R18 builds. Um, and one is actually close to Bernard's build, which had a fairing. So. Uh, are you good can you hear me yes we can hear you still keep talking oh, oh man i think we i think we might have lost you roland so i'm just gonna uh, i'm just gonna continue listen thanks ever ever so much for your input I'm just so gonna far. keep talking and hopefully you can hear me <laughs> all right keep talking roland all right you can hear me um yes okay okay um the uh yeah i actually have a sketch that that was a fairing bike similar i think we've got some thank uh, you guys this so was a fun project all right i think we yeah all right no, we're, we're stoked on this drag bike. Um, I'm looking forward to building more bikes for sure with, with the R platform. And I think we have another one on its way. So we'll start on that one soon. We'll post pictures of the build sketches of it. I'm not sure if you got that or not, but Roland, I think we've got some connection yeah, issues. So I'm going to say thank you very, very much for talking to us so far. Please stick around because we're going to head across to Austria now and introduce Bernard and the bike that you spoke about, whose latest creation. Maybe we can get a picture of uh, Bernard's bike on screen. Yeah, there it is. It's the Bletchman R18. And of course, it offers yet another unique interpretation of what can happen when you let your creativity run wild with a donor big boxer cruiser. So if you're there in Austria, welcome Bernard. It's Blechmann here. Welcome hey. at my workshop here in Austria. Hey, guys. For Listen, me, it's a pleasure great. to be with you. Thank you very Can much. You well, it's a me? pleasure to. Yes, yes, yeah. absolutely. Andy? Yeah. Okay, yeah. Fine. It's a pleasure to have you here on the uh, podcast, Bernard. Listen, congratulations on another unique interpretation for the new RA team. Um, I'm not sure if you know Roland already. 
And I'm not sure if Roland's still with us, but I wanted to ask him what he thinks of your bike. If you're there still, Roland, and if you can hear us, can you tell us what you think of the bike? Because uh, I believe you like it quite a bit. Yeah, I, I did Bernard's bike. And um, I don't know if you caught it earlier, but I one of my original sketches had a fairing on it and was like based on the stock bike. So when I saw Bernard's bike, I was like, oh, that thing's sick. And um, yeah, I mean, I, I think he did a really nice oh. job of maintaining the stock bike and, and making it extra special. And that's not an easy thing to do. Um, but uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I'm still trying to figure out the gas tank fairing, the narrowed gas tank and, and the piece that's on top of it. Um, and, and that crazy headlight and how you did all that. So um, I, got some, I got some YouTube to do. I, I want to know more about this bike. Hey, well, Thank you, wise Roland. words. But, uh, it's, it's great to hear and I appreciate. And I'm, I'm a fan of your work. And ever since, since the days of your glory stomper, you remember 15 years, oh, 15 years ago. Yeah, that's <laughs> quite a long time. But your work is inspiring. And to me, and it's a pleasure for me to meet you. And I like your bike too. Oh, thanks, I dude. Like I like the, the mean, I, the I mean and aggressive that, line. And, uh, but the, the most interesting part for me, uh, to, when we compare our, our both bikes, is I just uh, moved these parts of the bike and uh, that was uh, you live on. So we we gone a, a very different direction and a very different approach of our build. You you got me? Yeah, yeah. Um, so we changed you, the you whole leave, structure. You leave the, yes, you leave you leave the the stock uh, body parts, the the stock metal parts, yeah. sheet metal parts. Yeah. And I just I just uh, yeah swapped those things, and otherwise yeah. you know that's crazy, but I like that, and it's still an R eighteen, and yeah. it shows up the the range you can. You can customize this bike, and that's that's the the meaning. That's the sense of the Soul Fuel program, I I think. And so we nailed that. <laughs> I'm feeling left out here, guys. I feel like I wish I had a bike to show. Um, yeah, it's been. I forgot I was meant to be hosting a podcast then because I was just uh, laid back listening to you guys drinking my cup of tea like an Englishman. So uh, yeah. This, <laughs> The story continues. I think the story continues yeah. with every new bike that uh, breaks cover, and, and certainly from from your side, Bernard, it's it's been a fantastic interpretation. So, I mean, and the feedback on the forums as well. It's it's been amazing, hasn't it? Have you enjoyed reading all of those comments, Bernard? Oh, thanks a lot. There, there were uh, a plenty of great comments. I never expected so much attention for my work. It feels like my work is worth to do it. Yeah, it certainly was worth it, that's for sure. And interesting to hear you talking to Roland there about the completely different approaches. And because unlike a lot of customizers, you don't use sketches and renders. So can you just tell us a little bit about your process and, and how you ended up with this futuristic, fully fared cruiser interpretation, Bernard? Mm -hmm. You have to know, I draw my, li my lines, my design direct directly on the object using the final materials, the sheet metal. Uh, it allows me to directly respond to the requirements and to keep an eye on, on the proportion at all time and any angle. And I call that uh, rapid prototyping Blechmann style. <laughs> yeah, yeah, for sure. It's got a, it's got a bagger look about it, but without the bags somehow. So, tell us how you arrived at that distinctive front end. You know, with the details in the fairing, the headlight, the cut down bars, even, and and the narrower tank that Roland mentioned, of course. Where should I start? But 
I like sporty, narrow and streamlined looking bikes a lot. And so that was my intention from beginning on. But I had no clearly picture in mind of the bike in advance. I just followed my instincts, but I'm satisfied how it comes out. Yeah, it was interesting to hear you talking about that bike of Rollins from I don't know, 15 years ago. It was the stumpy you called it because you don't look that old to me. But I like the way you approach the tail section on, on this bike. It's, it seemed really, really neat. So how did you decide on that seat and the hump and, of course, the LED rear light as well? Huh. The, the rear part was my starting point of, so for my build. I want it as sporty and compact as it gets. And single seat, of course, I, it defines the proportions of the next step, the tank and the, at least uh, the fairing and, uh, yeah, and the seat rear as well. And the details are, yeah, are business as usual for me. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what I as, found I, as I mentioned, I follow. I followed my instincts. <laughs> you certainly do. You certainly do. Yeah. And, and what I found particularly interesting was that there's a lot of the original RI team that, that you've left a standard. You know, was it was it intentional to show what can be done by leaving the original chassis untouched, but as you've done, really going to town with the bodywork? Yes. For me, my Blechmann R18 is a kind of a purpose build. It should show up the options and the possibilities uh, uh, R18 provide without touching the original and homologated chassis. So the customer can comprehend what the bike looks like only with different body parts. Uh, to be yeah. more valuable for the brand BMW in the end. And that was my approach from the beginning on. Yeah, I totally understand that one. But what people are always interested to know is how long did the build take? And what is your particularly well, favorite view of it? You know, what perspective do you like best when you're yeah, walking yeah. around the bike and looking at it? it the build, it takes me around uh, 450 hours, man hours to finish, including a few uh, helping hands for tasks like casting parts, lettering, and so on. I, and uh, when it comes to the perspective, I like the I, I like it the best from behind. It's exciting. It's exciting to me to watch the proportions from the tailpipes, see the rear, the engine, over the tank to the fairing. It comes out very well. The perfect point to watch it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm really looking forward to seeing it in the metal burner because it, it looks fantastic in the pictures, but I just really want to walk around it and maybe even sort of sit on it and touch it if it's allowed. But listen, cheers, Bernard. We really appreciate your time today. Whoa, whoa, and of whoa, course, whoa. your team's effort. One, one, more, one more question, please, Andy. Go ahead. Is Go ahead. Roland, is Roland, is Roland uh, still here in the studio in connection? I don't know. We'll, we'll just need to check. I can see the bike. Oh, fuck. He's... <laughs> <laughs> Roland is leaving. Put it like, put it oh, like this. Oh, a shame. Yeah, yeah. put it like this. We're, we're still connected to him. We're still connected to him, but he might not be connected yeah. to us. But I, but I, I'm just going to check. It's a good, it's a good point though, Bernard, because I'm just going to check before we bring the podcast to a close, if there are any questions that still need answering, because I, I know I've asked about a hundred of them so far. So, Listen, the guys in the background, Nicholas, if there are any questions that have come in. Oh, here we go. <laughs> now, this one's from Tommy Kearns. Oh, he is watching after all. And it's for, oh, it's for Edgar. He wants to hear Edgar's feedback on these bikes. I I don't know, Bernard, if Edgar's still connected. I don't know if he's watching in the studio. Um, is he still in the oh. studio watching the podcast? Nicholas, have, have you still got, I know you got the feed open to uh, Roland. Have you still That's got the feed open luck. to Munich? Maybe he's still there. Let me just... Ah, you are watching, sir. Oh, brilliant. All right, listen. Edgar, are you, have you still got your mic on? I just heard about Tommy. Is it... I mean, is it, is it Tommy? 
I mean, it's my... the it's the Tommy Kearns, yeah, and he, my... he was basically he's wanting some reaction on those two bikes, so uh, probably just wanting to put you on the spot a little bit, you know. So, over to you, talk away. What do you think of the, both of these bikes that we've just been speaking about? I mean, come on, this, this Tommy, my friend Butterscotch Tommy, he wants to you know to fleece me. I don't know, Tommy, you're probably online. I don't know. Uh, that's a bit of an unfair question. Uh, on the one hand, but I mean, first of all, yeah, uh, I mean, I love both bikes. They are both marvelous. I have seen Bernard's bike. I have seen the, how do you say the Blechman? It's called the Blechmann bike. Uh, Andy, by the way, sorry. Uh, I have not seen uh, Roland's bike uh, in flesh and blood, but uh, I think, I hope I will see soon. I mean, both bikes, to be serious now, I mean, both bikes are superb bikes. I really love both of them. For us, it's super interesting to see these super creative minds uh, working out their interpretation of the bike. First of all, what I love perfectly, both bikes are 18s, or 18s, due to the fact that, that the engine is just so massive that whatever build you do, you always see it's a BMW boxer bike. And this is, I mean, first of all, this is a statement. And this is something I really love. Uh, secondly, I think, like I said, both these super creative minds, they have their own style. And this is what I really love also. I mean, everything Roland does, since I know Roland, I know him for some time, everything he does is always performance related. And I mean, you can't just expect this, but every time it's, it's adding something on top. It's super nice. Uh, and this is uh, also good, f let's say, from our point of view, because in America, this is exactly, uh, exactly uh, Roland's approach. It's about acceleration, quarter mile. This is how Americans love performance. It's this like this, uh, uh, yeah, this kind of performance. On the other hand, what Bernard does, it's it's extremely thrilling also to me because this is more like a very artistic approach what I feel. I mean Bernard, we talked a lot about this, uh, his build and he literally starts with a sheet metal. He doesn't have a drawing, he doesn't have anything, he just starts with a sheet metal and he starts hammering that whole thing and somehow it comes to life. Uh, this is really, uh, this is artistic, this is a, an, he's an artist, you can really say. Uh, and and at the end of the day, it's it's a yeah it's again it's a sculpture in metal. So both bikes are super nice, super lovely. Uh, I'm a I'm a big fan of both bikes. Uh, it's again it's a little bit unfair. I mean uh, we do these concept bikes once in a while, and that gives a little glimpse into this world. You can you can forget about homologation. You can forget about whatever fenders or headlights or blinkers. This this stuff you don't want to have on your bikes, but you have to, you've got to have. Um, and a little bit we have this when we do the concept bikes. So I have a little feeling of what these guys are doing, but I mean, uh, super nice works, super cut out to both of them. Uh, I really love all their works. Tommy, thanks for the question. <laughs> yeah, cheers, Tommy. That was a, that was a good one. And, and cheers, Ed for, Edgar, for sticking on the line and uh, being around to answer that. Really appreciate it. Right, I really do think we've got to th bring things to a close now. And thanks to everyone involved. Bernard, if, if you're still watching. Christian, if you're still watching. And, and Roland, uh, wherever you are. Um, all of our guests, in fact. <laughs> all of the backroom boys and girls in Munich as well for setting this up and, and bringing those R18s into the studio. I still don't know how you managed to fit those bikes into the elevator, but I'm glad you did because you've helped give many viewers a really good idea of the extensive list of options for them to personalize their rides. And last but least, thanks to all of you for watching, and I hope you enjoyed it. We've got a lot to get through, and we've been talking for a long time, but I've had a fantastic time and, and learned loads too. And we know there's loads of excitement about the R18 that loads of deposits have already been taken, and the wait is nearly over for those lucky first customers. So until next time, then, it's farewell from me and all the other guys who've participated, and we'll hopefully see you out on the road soon. So take care out there. Bye for now.